Warning, the video you are about to watch may contain language and scenarios of a highly adult nature and is therefore not intended for children under the age of 18. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, what is up guys? This is Couch Potato Mike back in the book club for another gripping and possibly very hot Chapter of Grey by E.L. James. Uh, before I get into it, though, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I, I want to thank you all for subscribing. At the time of recording, I'm in like a 411 subs, which is awesome. I never thought I'd get that far. And I know there's plenty of channels out there that have millions of subs, millions and millions, and I would love millions of subs. I really would. And if you're not one of my 411 subs, you can help me reach that goal of millions of subs just by clicking that little subscribe button it's absolutely free it comes with a money back guarantee and it won't hurt a thing and it'll make me happy you know kind of like that and uh what, while you're subbing hit that bell icon so you know when my next uh, chapter comes out life is a little hectic right now so i haven't been able to put chapters out on as regular a schedule as I would like, and for that I do apologize, guys, but I want to thank you all for, you know, clicking that play button each and every time. It makes me so very, very happy. It really does. Uh, so, you know, do that. Subscribe. Like. Oh, yeah, the thumbs up. Do that, too. Helps out with that algorithm. Helps people know I'm here. Uh, now, I do have my uh, 400 subscriber giveaway coming up. Um, at this point... I know I said it, I was already going to do the giveaway, but I am, just like I did with the uh, last uh, book, I am going to go ahead and let this giveaway run until um, until I finish this one. I've got a few more chapters left. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven chapters. It's seven more videos that gives you plenty of time to enter. I am keeping tabs. I'm keeping track of everybody that's entered, and the winner of that 400 subscriber giveaway will win these two wonderful Funko Pops. If you haven't seen my other videos, I also collect and unbox Funko Pops. It's one of my other passions. Can't help it, I'm a geek. And we have Harley Quinn here from uh, the Suicide Squad movie, and we have the Reconnaissance Dalek from the television show Doctor Who. Two of my favorite things. I collect, you know, Doctor Who and Harley Quinn Pops, and just thought I'd share the love. So, I know. You're like, listen, fat hairy dude, start reading the book. So, okay, I will. And today's chapter takes place on, and we didn't get that much more, Thursday, June the 2nd of 2011. No, don't leave me. The whispered words penetrate my slumber and I stir and wake. What was that? I look around the room. Where the hell am I? Oh, yes, Savannah. No, please. Don't leave me. What? It's Anna. I'm not going anywhere, I mutter. Bemused, turning, I prop myself up on my elbow. She's huddled beside me, and she looks like she's asleep. I won't, I won't leave you, she mumbles. My scalp prickles. I'm very glad to hear that. She sighs. Anna? I whisper. But she doesn't react. Her eyes are closed. She's fast asleep. She must be dreaming. What is she dreaming about? Christian, she says. Yes, I respond automatically. But she says nothing. She's definitely asleep. But I've never heard her talk in her sleep before. I watch her, fascinated. Her face is illuminated by ambient light from the living area. Her brow crinkles for a moment as if in an unpleasant thought is plaguing her. Then it's smooth once more. With her lips parted as she breathes, her face, so her face soft in sleep. She's beautiful. And she doesn't want me to go. And she won't leave me. The candor of her subconscious admission sweeps through me like a summer breeze, leaving warmth and hope in its wake. She's not going to leave me. Well, you have your answer, Gray. I smile down at her. <clears throat> she seems to have settled and stopped talking. A 
I checked the time on the radio alarm, 4.57. It's time to get up anyway, and I'm elated. I'm going soaring with Anna. I love soaring. I place a quick kick on her temple and rise and head into the main room of the suite where I order breakfast and check the local weather report. Another hot day and high humidity. No rain. I shower quickly, dry myself, then gather Anna's clothes from the bathroom and lay them out on a chair near the bed. As I pick up her panties, I remember how deviant my devious plan to confiscate her underwear backfired. Oh, Miss Steele. And after our first night together... <clears throat> oh, by the way, I'm wearing your underwear. And she yanks the waistband up so I could see the words Polo and Ralph peeking over her jeans. I shake my head, and from the armoire, I take a pair of my boxer briefs and deposit them on the chair. I like it when she wears my clothes. She mumbles again, and I think she said cage, but I'm not sure. What the hell is that about? She doesn't stir, but remains blissfully asleep while I dress. As I pull on my t-shirt, there's a knock on the door. Breakfast has arrived. Pastries, a coffee for me, and Twining's English breakfast tea for Anna. Fortunately, the hotel stocks her favorite blend. Sorry guys, gotta get comfortable here. It's time to wake Miss Steele. Strawberry, she mutters as I sit down beside her on the bed. What's with the fruit? Anastasia, I summon her gently. I want more. I know you do, and so do I. Come on, baby. I continue to coax her awake. She gripes. No, I want to touch you. Shit. Wake up. I lean down and gently tuck her earlobe with my teeth. No, she screws her eyes tight. Wake up, baby. Oh, no, she protests. Time to get up, baby. I'm going to switch on the side. I'm going to switch on the side light. I reach across and switch it on, bathing her in a pool of dim light. She squints. No, she whines. <clears throat> Her reluctance to wake is amusing and different. In my previous relationships, a sleepy submissive could expect to be disciplined. I nuzzle her ear and whisper, I want to chase the dawn with you. I kiss her cheek, kiss each eyelid in turn and kiss the tip of her nose and kiss her lips. Her eyes flicker open. Good, good morning, beautiful. <clears throat> and they close again. She grumbles and I grin down at her. You are not a morning person. She opens one unfocused eye, studying me. I thought you wanted sex, she says, her relief obvious. I suppress my laugh. Anastasia, I always want sex with you. It's heartwarming to know that you feel the same way. Of course I do, just not when it's so late, she hugs her pillow. It's not late, it's early. Come on, up you go. We're going out. I'll take a rain check on the sex. I was having such a nice dream, she sighs, peering up at me. Dream about what? You. Her face warms. What was I doing this time? Trying to feed me strawberries, she says with a small voice. That accounts for her babbling. Dr. Flynn could have a field day with that one. Up, oh, get dressed. Don't bother to shower. We can do that later. She, pro she protests but sits up, ignoring the sheet that slips down to her waist and exposes her body. My cock stirs. With her hair must cascading over her shoulders and curling up around her naked breasts, she looks gorgeous. Ignoring my arousal, I stand up to give her some room. Sorry. What time is it? She asks, her voice sleepy. 5.30 in the morning. Feels like 3 a.m. We don't have much time. I let you sleep as long as possible. Come. I want to drag her out of bed and dress her myself. I can't wait to get her airborne. Can I have a shower? If you have a shower, I'll want one with you, and you and I know what will happen then. The day will just go. Come. She gives me a patient look. What are we doing? It's a surprise. I told you. <clears throat> she shakes her head and beams, very much amused. Okay. She climbs out of bed. 
oblivious to her nudity, and notices her clothes on the chair. I'm delighted that she's not her usual shy self. Maybe it's because she's sleepy. She slides on my underwear and gives me a broad smile. I'll give you some room now that you're up. Leaving her to, leaving her to dress, I wander back into the main room, sit down at the small dining table, and help myself to some coffee. She joins me a few minutes later. Eat, I order, motioning for her to take a seat. <clears throat> she stares at me, transfixed, her eyes glazed. Anastasia, I say, interrupting her daydream. Her eyelashes flutter as she comes back from wherever she's been. I'll have some tea. Can I take a croissant for later? She asks, hopefully. She's not going to eat. Don't rain on my parade, Anastasia. I'll eat later when my stomach's woken up. About 7.30, okay? Okay. I can't force her. She looks defiant and stubborn. I want to roll my eyes at you, she says. Oh, Anna, bring it on. By all means do, and you will make my day. She looks up at the fire sprinkler on the ceiling. Well, a spanking would wake me up, I suppose, she says, as if she's weighing the option. She's considering it? It doesn't work that way, Anastasia. On the other hand, I don't want you to be all hot and bothered. The climate here is warm enough. She gives me a saccharine smile. You are, as ever, challenging, Miss Steele. My voice is droll. Drink your tea. She sits down and takes a couple of sips. Drink up. We should go. I'm keen to get on the road. It's quite a drive. Where are we going? You'll see. Stop with the grinning, Gray. She pouts with frustration. Miss Steele, as ever, is curious. But all she's wearing is her camisole and jeans. She'll be cold once we're airborne. Finish your tea, I order, and leave the table. In the bedroom, I rifle through the armoire and pull out one of my sweatshirts. This should do. I call the valet and tell him to bring the car out front. I'm ready, she says as I return to the main room. You'll need this. I toss the sweatshirt to her. She gives me a bewildered look. Trust me. I plant a swift kiss on her lips. Taking her hand, I open the door to the suite and we head for the elevators. There's a hotel employee standing there, Brian, according to his name tag, also waiting for the elevator. Good morning, he says, giving us both a cheerful salute as the doors open. I glance at Anna and smirk as we enter. No shenanigans in the elevators this morning. She hides her smile and peers at the floor, her cheeks coloring. She knows exactly what's going through my mind. Brian wishes us a good day as we exit. Outside, the valet is waiting with the Mustang. Anna arches a brow, impressed by the G2 500. GT500. Yeah, it's a fun drive, even if it's only a Mustang. You know, sometimes it's great being me. I tease her with a polite bow. I open the door. Where are we going? You'll see. I get behind the wheel and ease the car into drive. At the stoplight, I quickly program the address of the airfield into the GPS. It directs us out, out of Savannah toward I-95. I switch on my iPod via the steering wheel, and the car is filled with a sublime melody. What's this? Anna asks. It's from La Traviata, an opera by Verdi. La Traviata? I've heard of that. I can't think where. What does it mean? I give her a knowing look. Well, literally, the woman led astray. It's based on Alexandre Dumas' book, La Dame aux Camélias. I've, re oh, I've read it. I thought you might have. The doomed courtesan, she recounts, her voice tinged with melancholy. Hmm, it's a depressing story, she says. Too depressing? We can't have that. Miss Steele, especially when I'm in such a good mood. Do you want to choose some music? This is on my iPod. I tap the navigation screen and bring up the playlist. You choose, I offer, wondering if she'll like anything I have in iTunes. She studies the list and scrolls through it, concentrating hard. She taps on a song, and Verde's dulcet strings are replaced by a pounding beat and Britney Spears. Toxic, eh? I observe with wry humor. She trying to tell me something? She referring to me? I don't know what you mean, she says innocently. Does she think I should wear a warning? Miss Steele wants to play games. So be it. I turn the music down a tad. It's a little early for this remix. 
And for the reminder. Sir, the submissive respectfully requests Master's iPod. I glance away from the spreadsheet I'm reading and study her as she kneels beside me, her eyes cast down. She's been exceptional this weekend. How can I refuse? Sure, Layla. Take it. I think it's in the dock. Thank you, Master, she says and stands with her usual grace without looking at me. Good girl. And wearing only red-high heels, she teeters over to the iPod dock and collects her reward. I didn't put the song in my iPod. I tell her breezily and floor the gas, throwing us both into the back of our seats. But I hear Anna's small, exasperated huff above the roar of the engine. As Brittany continues at her sultry best, Anna drums her fingers on her thigh, radiating disquiet as she stares out of the car window. The Mustang eats up the miles on the freeway. There's no traffic and Dawn's first light is chasing us down I-95. Anna sighs as Damien Rice begins. Put her out of her misery, Gray. And I don't know if it's my good mood, our talk last night, or the fact that I'm about to go soaring, but I want to tell her who put the song on my iPod. It was Layla. Layla? An ex who put the song on my iPod. One of the 15? She turns her full attention to me, hungry for information. Yes. What happened to her? We finished. Why? She wanted more. And you didn't? I glance at her and shake my head. I've never wanted more until I met you. She rewards me with her bashful smile. Yes, Anna. It's not just you who wants more. What happened to the other 14? She asks. You want a list? Divorced, beheaded, died? You're not Henry VIII, she scolds me. Okay, in no particular order. I've only had a long-term relationships with four women apart from Elena. Elena? Mrs. Robinson to you. She pauses for a moment, and I know she's scrutinizing me. I keep my eyes on the road. What happened to the four, she asks. So inquisitive, so eager for information, Miss Steele, I tease. Oh, Mr. W oh, Mr. When is your period due? Anastasia, a man needs to know these things. Does he? I do. Why? Because I don't want to get you pregnant. Neither do I. Well, not for a few years yet, she says a little wistfully. Of course, that would, that would be with someone else. The thought is disquieting. She's mine. So, the other four, what happened, she persists. One met someone else. The other three wanted more. I wasn't in the market for more then. Why did I open this can of worms? And the others? Just didn't work out. She nods and stares out of the window as Aaron Neville sings, tell it like it is. Where are we headed, she asks again. We're close now. An airfield. We're not going back to Seattle, are we? She sounds panicked. No, Anastasia. I chuckle at her reaction. We're going to indulge in my second favorite pastime. Second? Yep, I told you my favorite this morning. Her expression tells me she's completely perplexed. Indulging in you, Miss Steele. That's got to be top of my list. Anyway, I can get you. Anyway, I can get you. She looks down at her lap, her lips twitching. Well, that's quite high up on my list of diverting kinky priorities, too, she says. I'm pleased to hear it. So, airfield? I beam at her. Soaring. We're going to chase the dawn, Anastasia. I take a left into the airfield and drive up to the Brunswick Soaring Association hangar where I stop the car. You up for this? I ask. You're flying? Yes. Her face glows with excitement. Yes, please! I love how fearless and enthusiastic she is with any new experience. Leaning over, I kiss her quickly. Another first, Miss Steele. Outside it's cool, but not cold, and the sky is lighter now, pearl and bright at the horizon. I walk around the car and open Anna's door. With her hand in mine, we make our way to the front of the hangar. Taylor is waiting there with a young bearded man in shorts and sandals. Mr. Gray, this is your tow pilot, Mr. Mark Benson, says Taylor. I release Anna so I can shake hands with Benson, who has a wild glint in his eye. I've got a great morning for it, Mr. Gray, Benson says. The wind is at ten knots from the northeast, which means the convergence along these shores should keep you up for a wee while. Benson is British, with a firm handshake. 
Sounds great, I answer and watch Anna as she shares a private joke with Taylor. Anastasia, come. See you later, she says to Taylor. Ignoring her familiarity with my staff, I introduce her to Benson. Mr. Benson, this is my girlfriend, Anastasia Steele. Pleased to meet you, she says, and Benson gives her a bright smile as they shake hands. Likewise, he says. If you'd like to follow me, lead the way. I take Anna's hand as we fall into step beside Benson. I'd like to stop right here and apologize to any of my um, viewers from uh, Great Britain. Um, everything I learned about doing British accents is like from movies, and I'm trying not to sound like Dick Van Dyke from uh, Mary Poppins. So if I do, sorry. I have the Blanick L23 set up and ready. She's old school, but she handles well. Great, I learned to fly in a Blanick. An L13, I tell Benson. Can't go wrong with a Blanick. I'm a big fan. He gives me a thumbs up. Though I prefer the L23 for the aerobatics. A nod in agreement. You're hooked up to my Piper Pony, he continues. I'll take her up to 3,000 feet and set you guys free. That should give you some flying time. I hope so. The cloud cover looks promising. It's a bit early in the day for much lift, but you never know. Dave, my mate, will spot the wing. He's in the Jake's. Okay, I think. Jake's means restroom. You've been flying long? Since my days in the RAF, but I've been flying these tail draggers for five years now. We're on CTAF 122.3, so you know. Got it. The L-23 looks to be in fine shape. And I make a note of her FAA registration. November Papa 3 Alpha. First, we need to, need to strap on your parachute. Benson reaches into the cockpit and pulls out a parachute for Anna. I'll do that, I offer, taking the bundle from Benson before he has a chance to put his hands on Anna. I'll fetch some ballast, Benson says with a cheery smile, and he heads toward the plane. You like strapping me into things, Anna says with a raised brow. Miss Steele, you have no idea. Here, step into the straps. I hold up the leg fastening hold up the leg fastening for her. Leaning over, she puts her hand on my shoulder. I stiffen instinctively, expecting the darkness to wake and choke me. But it doesn't. It's weird. I don't know how I'm gonna react where her touch is concerned. She lets go once the loops are around her thighs, and I hoist the shoulder straps over her arms and fasten the parachute. Boy, she looks good in a harness. Briefly, I wonder how she'd look spread eagle and hanging from the carabiners of my playroom, her mouth and her sex at my disposal. But alas, she set suspension as a hard limit. There, you'll do, I mutter, trying to banish the image from my mind. Do you have your hair tie from yesterday? You want me to you want me to put my hair up? She asks. Yes. She does as she's told for a change. In you go. I steady her with my hand, and she starts to climb into the back. No, front. The pilot sits in the back. But you won't be able to see. I'll see plenty. I'll see her enjoying herself. I hope. She climbs in, and I bend over into the cockpit to fasten her into her seat, locking the harness and tightening the straps. Hmm. Twice in one morning, I am a lucky man. I whisper and kiss her. She beams up at me, her anticipation palpable. This won't take long, 20, 30 minutes at most. Thermals aren't great this time of the morning. But it's so breathtaking up there at this hour. I hope you're not nervous. Excited, she says, still grinning. Good. I stroke her cheek with my index finger, then put my own parachute on and climb into the pilot seat. Benson comes back, carrying ballast for Anna, and he checks her straps. Yep, that's secure. First time? He asks her. Yes, you'll love it. Thanks, Mr. Benson, Anna says. Call me Mark. He replies, fucking twinkling at her. I narrow my eyes at him. Okay? He asks me. Yep, let's go. I say, impatient to be airborne and get him away from my girl. Benson nods, shuts the canopy, and ambles over the over to the piper. Off to the right, I notice Dave, Benson's mate, has appeared, 
propping up the wing tip. Quickly, I test the equipment. Pedals. I hear the rudder move behind me. Control stick, side to side. A quick glance at the wings and I can see the ailerons moving. And control stick, front to back. I hear the elevator respond. Right, we're ready. Benson climbs up into the piper and almost immediately the single propeller starts up, loud and throaty in the morning quiet. A few minutes later, his plane is rolling forward, taking up the slack of the tow rope and we're off. I balance the ailerons and the rudder as Piper picks up speed. Then I ease back on the control stick and we sail into the air before Benson does. Here we go, baby! I shout to Anna as we gain height. Brunswick traffic, Delta Victor, heading to 270. It's Benson on the radio. I ignore him as, I ignore him as we climb higher and higher. The L-23 handles well and I watch Anna. Her head whips from side to side as she tries to take in the view. I wish I could see her smile. We head west, the newborn sun behind us, and I note when we cross I-95. I love the serenity up here, away from everything and everyone, just me and the glider looking for lift. And to think, I've never shared this experience with anyone before. The light is beautiful, lambent, all I had hoped it would be, for Anna and for me. When I check the altimeter, we're nearing 3,000 feet and coasting at 105 knots. Benson's voice crackles over the radio, informing the, me that we're at 3,000 feet and we can release. Affirmative. Release, I radio back and pull the release knob. The piper disappears and I roll us into a slow dip until we're headed southwest and riding the wind. Anna laughs out loud. Encouraged by her reaction, I continue to spiral, hoping we might find some convergence lift near the coastline or thermals beneath pale pink clouds. The shallow cumulus might mean lift, even this early. Suddenly, filled with a heady combination of mischief and joy, I shout at Anna, Hold on tight! And I take us into a full roll. She squeals, her hands shooting up and bracing against the canopy. When I write us once more, she's laughing. It is the most gratifying response a man could want, and it makes me laugh, too. I'm glad I didn't have breakfast, she shouts. Yes, in hindsight, it's good you didn't, because I'm going to do that again. This time, she holds onto the harness and stares directly down at the ground as she, as she suspended over it. She giggles, the noise mixing in the, with the whistle of the wind. Beautiful, isn't it? I shout. Yes, I know we haven't got long and there's not much lift out here, but I don't care. Anna is enjoying herself, and so am I. See the joystick in front of you? Grab hold. She tries to turn her head, but she's buckled in too tight. Go on, Anastasia, grab it, I urge her. My joystick moves in my hand, and I know she's holding hers. Hold tight. Keep it steady. See the middle dial in front? Keep the needle dead center. We continue to fly in a straight line, the yaw string staying perpendicular to the canopy. Good girl. My Anna never backs down from a challenge, and for some bizarre reason, I feel immensely proud of her. I'm amazed you let me take control, she shouts. You'd be amazed what I'd let you do, Miss Steele. Back to me now. In command of the joystick once more, I turn us in the direction of the airfield and we begin to lose altitude. I think I can land us there. I call over to the radio to inform Benson and whoever might be listening that we're going to land, and then I execute another circle to bring us closer to the ground. Hang on, baby. This can get bumpy. I dip again and bring the L-23 into line with the runway as we descend toward the grass. We land with a bump, and I manage to keep both wings up until we reach a teeth-jarring stop near the end of the runway. I unclip the canopy, open it, release my harness, and clamber out. I stretch my limbs, undo my parachute, and smile down at the rosy-cheeked Miss Steele. How is that? I ask, reaching down to unbuckle her from the seat and the parachute. That was extraordinary. Thank you, she says, her eyes sparkling with joy. Was it more? I pray she can't hear the hope in my voice. Much more, she beams, and I feel ten feet tall. Come. I hold up my hand and help her out of the cockpit. As she jumps down, I fold her into my arms, pulling her against me. Filled with adrenaline, my body responds immediately to her softness. In a nanosecond, my hands are in her hair and I'm tipping her head back so I can kiss her. 
My hand skims down to the base of her spine, pressing her against my growing erection, and my mouth takes hers in a long, lingering, possessive kiss. I want her, here, now, on the grass. She responds in kind, her fingers twisting in my hair, tugging, begging for more, and she opens up for me like a morning glory. I break away for air and rationality. Not in a field. Vincent and Taylor are nearby. Her eyes are luminous, pleading for more. Don't look at me like that, Anna. Breakfast, I whisper before I do something I'll regret. Turning, I clasp her hand and walk back down toward the car. What about the glider? She asks as she tries to keep up with me. Someone will take care of that. It's what I pay Taylor to do. We'll eat now. Come. She bounces along beside me, brimming with happiness. I don't know if I've ever seen her so buoyant. Her mood is infectious, and I don't remember if I've ever felt this upbeat. I can't help my big fat grin as I hold open the car door for her. With Kings of Leon belting from the sound system, I ease the Mustang out of the airfield toward I-95. As we cruise along the freeway, Anna's Blackberry starts beeping. What's that? I ask. Alarm for my pill, she mutters. Good. Well done. I hate condoms. From the sideways look I give her, I think she's rolling her eyes, but I'm not sure. I like that you introduced me to Mark as your girlfriend, she says, changing the subject. Isn't that what you are? Am I? I thought you wanted a submissive. So did I, Anastasia. And I do, but I've told you. I want more, too. I'm very happy that you want more, she says. We aim to please, Miss Steele. I tease as I pull onto the interne into an international house of pancakes, my father's guilty pleasure. I hop, she says in disbelief. The Mustang rumbles to a stop. I hope you're hungry. I would never have pictured you here. My dad used to bring us to one of these whenever my mom went away to a medical conference. We shuffle into a booth, facing each other. It was our secret. I pick up a menu, watching Anna as she tucks her hair behind her ears and examines what IHOP has to offer for breakfast. She licks her lips in anticipation and I'm forced to suppress my physical reaction. I know what I want, I whisper, and wonder how she would feel visiting the restroom with me. Her eyes meet mine and her pupils expand. I want what you want, she murmurs. As ever, Miss Steele does not back away from a challenge. Here? Are you sure, Anna? Her, ar her eyes dart around for a quiet the quiet restaurant, then come to rest on me, darkening and full of carnal promise. Don't bite your lip, I warn. Much as I'd like to, I'm not going to fuck her in the restroom at IHOP. She deserves better than that, and frankly, so do I. Not here, not now. If I can't have you here, don't tempt me. We're interrupted. Hi, my name's Leandra. What can I get for you, er, uh, folks, er... Uh, Today, this morning. Oh, God. I ignore the red-headed server. Anastasia, I prompt her. I told you, I want what you want. Hell, she might as well be addressing my groin. Shall I give you folks another minute to decide? The waitress asks. No, we know what we want. I cannot tear my gaze from Anna's. We'll have two portions of the original buttermilk pancakes with maple syrup and bacon on the side, two glasses of orange juice, one black coffee with skim milk, and one English breakfast tea, if you have it. Anna smiles. Thank you, sir. Will that be all? The waitress exclaims, all breathy and embarrassed. Tearing my attention away from Anna, I dismiss the waitress with a look and she scurries away. <clears throat> you know, it's really not fair, Anna says, her voice quiet as her fingers trace a figure eight on the table. What's not fair? How you disarm people, women, me. Do I disarm you? I'm stunned. All the time. It's just looks, Anastasia. No, Christian, it's much more than that. She has this the wrong way around, and once again, I tell her how disarming I found her. Her brows furrow. Is that why you've changed your mind? Changed my mind? Yes, about, uh, us. Have I changed my mind? I think I've just relaxed my boundaries a little, that's all. I don't think I've changed my mind, per se. 
We just need to redefine our parameters, redraw our battle lines, if you will. We can make this work, I'm sure. I want you submissive in my playroom. I will punish you if you digress from the rules. Other than that, well, I think it's all up for discussion. Those are my requirements, Miss Steele. What say you to that? So, I get to sleep with you in your bed? Is that what you want? Yes. I agree, then. Besides, I sleep very well when you're in my bed. I had no idea. I was frightened you'd leave me if I didn't agree to all that. She says, her face a little pale. I'm not going anywhere, Anastasia. Besides, how could she think that? I need to reassure. We're following your advice, your definition. Compromise. You emailed it to me, and so far, it's working for me. I love that you want more. I know. My tone is warm. How do you know? Trust me. I just do. You told me in your sleep. The waitress returns with our breakfast, and I watch Anna devour it. More seems to be working for her. This is delicious, she says. I like that you're hungry. Must have been all the exercise last night and the thrill this morning. It was a thrill, wasn't it? It was mighty fine, Mr. Gray. She says as she pops the final piece of pancake into her mouth. Can I treat you? She adds. Treat me how? Pay for this meal? I snort. I don't think so. Please, I want to. Are you trying to completely emasculate me? I raise an eyebrow in warning. This is probably the only place I'll be able to afford to pay. Anastasia, I appreciate the thought. I do, but no. She purses her lips with irritation when I ask the redhead for the check. Don't scowl, I warn. Check the time. It's 8.30. I have a meeting at 11.15 with Savannah Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, so unfortunately, we have to get back to the city. I contemplate canceling the meeting because I'd like to spend the day with Anna, but no, that's too much. I'm running after this girl when I should be concentrating on my business. Priorities, Gray. With her hand in mine, we head to the car, looking like any other couple. She swamped in my sweatshirt, looking casual, relaxed, beautiful, and yes, she's with me. Three guys strolling an IHOP check her out. She's oblivious, even when I put my arm around her to stake my claim. She really has no idea how lovely she is. I open her car door and she gives me a sunny smile. I could get used to this. I program her mother's address into the GPS and we set off north on I-95, listening to the Foo Fighters. Anna's feet tap to the beat. This is the sort of music she likes, all American rock. The traffic on the freeway is heavier now, with commuters heading into the city. But I don't care. I like being here with her, spending time, holding her hand, touching her knee, watching her smile. She tells me about the previous visit to Savannah. She's not keen on the heat either, but her eyes light up when she talks about her mother. It'll be interesting to see her interacting with her mother and stepfather this evening. I pull up outside her mother's house with some regret. I wish we could play hooky all day. The last 12 hours have been nice. More than nice, Gray. Sublime. Do you want to come in? She asks. I need to work, Anastasia, but I'll be back this evening. What time? She suggests seven, then looks from her hands to me, her eyes bright and joyful. Thank you for the more. My pleasure, Anastasia. I lean over and kiss her, inhaling her sweet, sweet scent. I'll see you later. Try to stop me, I whisper. She climbs out of the car, still in my sweatshirt, and waves goodbye. I head back to the hotel, feeling a little emptier now that she's not with me. In my room, I call Taylor. Mr. Gray? Yeah, thanks for organizing this morning. You're most welcome, sir. He sounds surprised. I'll be ready to leave at 1045 for the meeting. I'll have the Suburban waiting outside. Thanks. I change out of my jeans and into my suit, but leave my favorite tie beside my laptop as I order up a coffee from room service. I work through my emails, drink coffee, and consider calling Roz. However, it's too early for her. I read through all the paperwork that Bill has sent. Savannah does make a good case for the sighting and sighting the plant here. I check my inbox and there's a new message from Anna. From Anastasia Steele, subject soaring as opposed to soaring, June 2nd, 2011, 1020 Eastern Standard Time to Christian Gray. 
Sometimes you really know how to show a girl a good time. Thank you, Anna X. The title makes me laugh, and the kiss makes me feel ten feet tall. I type up my response. From Christian Gray, subject soaring versus soaring. June 2nd, 2011, 1024, EST to Anastasia Steele. I'll take either of those over your snoring. I had a good time too, but I always do when I'm with you. Christian Gray, CEO, Grand Enterprises Holdings, Inc. Her answer is almost immediate. Anastasia Steele, subject snoring. June 2nd, 2011, 1026, EST to Christian Gray. I do not snore. And if I do, it's very ungallant of you to point it out. You were no gentleman, Mr. Gray, and you were in and you were in the deep south too, Anna. I chuckle. From Christian Gray's subject Somniloquy, June second, twenty eleven to ten uh, ten twenty eight EST to Anastasia Steele. I have never claimed to be a gentleman, Anastasia, and I think I've demonstrated that point to you on numerous occasions. I am not intimidated by your shouty capitals, but I will confess to a small white lie. No, you don't snore. But you do talk, and it's fascinating. What happened to my kiss? Christian Gray, CAD and CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. This will drive her crazy. From Anastasia Steele, subject Spill the Beans, June 2nd, 2011, 1032 EST to Christian Gray. You are a CAD and a scoundrel. Definitely no gentleman. So, what did I say? No kisses until you talk. Oh, this could run and run. From Christian Gray, subject Sleeping Talking Beauty, June 2nd, 2011, 1035 EST to Anastasia Steele. It would be most ungallant of me to say, and I have already been chastised for that. But if you behave yourself, I may tell you this evening, I do have to go into a meeting now. Laters, baby. Christian Gray, CEO, Cat and Scoundrel, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. With a broad grin, I slip on my tie, grab my jacket, and head downstairs to find Taylor. Just over an hour later, I'm winding up my meeting with the Savannah Brownfield Redevelopment Authority. Georgia has a great deal to offer, and the team has promised GEH some serious tax incentives. There's a knock at the door, and Taylor enters, with the, small, enters the small conference room. His face looks grim. But what's more worrying is that he never, ever interrupts my meetings. My scalp freckles. Anna, is she okay? Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, he says to all of us. Yes, Taylor, I ask as he approaches and speaks discreetly in my ear. We have a situation at home concerning Miss Layla Williams. Layla? What the hell? A part of me is relieved that it's not Anna. Would you excuse me, please? I ask the two men and two women from the SBRA. In the hallway... Taylor's tone is grave as he apologizes once more for interrupting my meeting. Don't worry. Tell me what happened. Miss Williams is in an ambulance on the way to the ER at Seattle Free Hope. Ambulance? Yes, sir. She broke into the apartment and made a suicide attempt in front of Mrs. Jones. Fuck. Suicide? Layla? In my apartment? She slashed her wrists. Gail went with her in the ambulance. She's informed me that the EMTs arrived in time and Miss Williams is not in any immediate danger. Why a scala? Why in front of Gail? I'm shocked. Taylor shakes his head. I don't know, sir. Neither does Gail. She can't get any sense out of Miss Williams. Apparently, she only wants to talk to you. Fuck. Exactly, sir. Taylor says without judgment. I scrape my hands through my hair, trying to grasp the magnitude of what Layla has done. What the hell am I supposed to do? Why did she come to me? Was she expecting to see me? Where's her husband? What's happened to him? How's Gail? A little shaken. I'm not surprised. I thought you should know, sir. Yes, sure, thanks. I mumbled, distracted. I can't believe it. Layla seemed happy when she last emailed me, what, six or seven months ago? But there's been no answers for me here in Georgia. I have to go back and talk to her. Find out why. Tell Stefan to ready the jet. I need to go home. Will do. Let's leave as soon as we can. I'll be in the car. Thank you. Taylor heads toward the exit, raising the phone to his ear. I'm reeling. Layla. What the hell? She's been out of my life for a couple of years. We've shared the occasional email. She got married. She seemed happy. 
What's happened? I head back into the boardroom and make my apologies before stepping outside into the stifling heat where Taylor is waiting in the Suburban. The plane will be ready in 45 minutes. We can head back to the hotel, pack and go, he informs me. Good, I respond, grateful for the car's air conditioning. I should call Gail. I've tried, but her phone goes to voicemail. I think she's still at the hospital. Okay, I'll call her later. This is not what Gail needs on a Thursday morning. How did Layla get into the apartment? I don't know, sir. Taylor makes an eye contact with me in the rearview mirror, his face apologetic and grim at once. I'll make a priority to find out. Our bags are packed and we're on our way to Savannah Hilton Head Inter International when I call Anna, but frustratingly she doesn't answer. I brood, staring out of the window as we cruise toward the airport. I don't have to late, wait long for her to return my call. Anastasia. Hi, she says, her voice breathy, and it's such a pleasure to hear her. I have to return to Seattle. Something's come up. I'm on my way to the airport now. Please apologize to your mother. I can't make dinner. Nothing serious, I hope. I have a situation that I have to deal with. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll send Taylor to beat you with SeaTac if I can't come myself. Okay, she sighs. I hope you sort out your situation. Have a safe flight. I wish I didn't have to go. You too, baby. I whisper and hang up before I change my mind and stay. I call Roz as we taxi toward the runway. Christian, how Savannah? I'm on the plane coming home. I have a problem I have to deal with. Something to GEH? Roz asks alarm. No, it's personal. Anything I can do? No. I'll see you tomorrow. How did your meeting go? Positive. But I had to cut it short. Let's see what they put in writing. I might d prefer Detroit just because it's cooler. The heat's that bad? Suffocating. I've got to go. I'll call for an update later. Safe travels, Christian. On the flight, I throw myself into work to distract me from the problem waiting at home. By the time we've touched down, I've read three reports and written 15 emails. Our car is waiting and Taylor drives me through the pouring rain straight to Seattle, free hope. I have to see Layla and find out what the hell is going on. As we near the hospital, my anger surfaces. Why would she do this to me? The rain is lashing down as I climb out of the car. The day is as bleak as my mood. I take a deep breath to control my fury and head through the front doors. At the reception desk, I ask for Layla Reed. Are you family? The nurse on duty glowers at me, her mouth pinched and sour. No, I sigh. This is going to be difficult. Well, I'm sorry. I can't help you. She tried to open a vein in my apartment. I think I'm entitled to know where the hell she is. I hiss through my teeth. Don't take that tone with me, she snaps. I glare at her. I'm not going to get anywhere with this woman. Where's your yard apartment? Sir, there's nothing we can do if you're not family. Don't worry. I'll find it myself. I growl and storm over to the double doors. I know I could call my mother, who would expedite this for me, but then I'd have to explain what's happened. The ER is bustling with doctors and nurses. The triage is full of patients. I accost a young nurse and give her my brightest smile. Hello, I'm looking for Layla Reed. She was admitted earlier today. Can you tell me where she might be? And you are? She asks as a flesh is creeping over her face. I'm her brother. I lie smoothly, ignoring her reaction. This way, Mr. Reed. She bustles over to the nurse's station and checks her computer. She's on the second floor, behavioral health ward. Take the elevators at the end of the corridor. Thanks. I reward her with a wink as she pushes a stray lock behind her ear, giving me a flirtatious smile that reminds me of a certain girl I left in Georgia. As I step out of the elevator on the second floor, I know something is wrong. On the other side of what looks like locked doors, two security guards and a nurse are combing the corridor, Checking each room, my scalp prickles, but I walk over to the reception area, pretending not to notice the commotion. Can I help you? asks the young man with a ring through his nose. I'm looking for Layla Reed, I'm her brother. He pales. Oh, Mr. Reed, can you come with me? I follow him to a waiting room and sit down on a plastic chair that he points to. I note it's bolted to the floor. The doctor will be with you shortly. Why can't I see her? I ask. The doctor will explain. He says, his expression guarded, and he exits before I can ask any further questions. Shit, perhaps I'm too late. The thought nauseates me. 
I get up and pace the small room, contemplating to call Gale, but I don't know how. But I don't have to wait long. A young man with short dreads and dark, intelligent eyes enters. See your doctor, Mister Reed. He asks, "Where's Layla?" He assesses me for a moment, then sighs and steals himself. I'm afraid I don't know, he says. She managed to give us the slip. What? She's gone. How she got out, I don't know. Got out? I exclaim in disbelief and sink onto one of the chairs. He sits down opposite me. Yes, she's disappeared. We're doing a search for her now. She's still here? We don't know. And who are you, I ask. I'm Dr. Azikawi. I'm Z- Az- 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 Kiwi. Yeah. I'm Dr. Azikiwi, the old call psychiatrist. He looks too young to be a psychiatrist. What can you tell me about Layla, I ask. Well, she was admitted after a failed suicide attempt. She tried to slash one of her wrists in her next boyfriend's house. His housekeeper brought her here. I feel the blood draining from my face. And, I ask, I need more information. That's about as much as we know. She said it was an error of judgment, that she was fine, but she, but we wanted to keep her here under observation and ask her further questions. Did you talk to her? I did. Why did she do this? She said it was a cry for help, nothing more. And having made such a spectacle of herself, she was embarrassed and wanted to go home. She said she didn't want to kill herself. I believe her. I suspect it was just a suicidal ideation on her part. How could you let her escape? I run my hand through my hair, trying to contain my frustration. I don't know how she's gotten away. There'll be an internal investigation. If she contacts you, I suggest you urge her to come back. She needs help. Can I ask you some questions? Sure. I agree, distracted. Is there any history of mental illness in your family? I frown, then remember that he's talking about Layla's family. I don't know. My family is very private about such matters. He looks concerned. Do you know anything about this ex-boyfriend? No, I state a little too weakly. Have you contacted her husband? The doctor's eyes widen. She's married? Yes. That's not what she told us. Oh, well, I'll call him. I won't waste any more of your time. But I have more questions for you. I'd rather spend my time looking for her. her. She's obviously in a bad way, I rise. But this husband, I'll get in touch with him. This is getting me nowhere. But we should do that, Dr. Ezekiwi Iz- says, as a Kiwi. Dr. Ezekiwi stands. I can't help you. I need to find her. I head to the door. Mr. Reed, goodbye, I mutter, hurrying out of the waiting room and not bothering with the elevator. I take the fire escape stairs two at a time. I loathe hospitals. A memory from my childhood surfaces. I'm small and scared and mute and smell of disinfectant and blood clouds my nostrils. I shudder. As I step out of the hospital, I stand for a moment and let the torrential rain wash the memory away. It's been a stressful afternoon, but at least the rain is a refreshing relief from the heat of Savannah. Taylor swings around to pick me up in the SUV. Home, I direct him as I get back in the car. Once I've buckled my seatbelt, I call Welch for my cell. Mr. Gray, he growls. Welch, I have a problem. I need you to locate Layla Reed, nay Williams. Gail is pale and quiet as she studies me with concern. You're not going to finish, sir, she asks. I shake my head. Was the food okay? Yes, of course, I give her a small smile. After today's events, I'm not hungry. How are you bearing up? I'm good, Mr. Gray. It was a total shock. I just want to keep busy. I hear you. Thanks for making dinner. If you remember anything, let me know. Of course. But like I said, she only wanted to speak with you. Why? What does she expect me to do? Thanks for not involving the police. The police are not what that girl needs. She needs help. She does. I wish I knew where she was. You'll find her, she says with quiet confidence, surprising me. Do you need anything, I ask. No, Mr. Gray, I'm fine. She takes the plate with my half-eaten meal to the sink. The news from Welch about Layla is frustrating. The trail has gone cold. She's not at the hospital, and they're still mystified as to how she escaped. A small part of me admires that. She was always resourceful. But what could have made her so unhappy? I rest my head in my hands. What a day. 
From the sublime to the ridiculous. Soaring with Anna and now this mess to deal with. Taylor is at a loss as to how Layla got into the apartment and Gail has no idea either. Apparently, Layla marched into the kitchen demanding to know where I was and when Gail said I wasn't there, she cried out, he, he's gone, then slashed her wrist with a box cutter. Fortunately, the cut wasn't deep. I glance at Gail cleaning up in the kitchen. My, bl my blood runs cold. Layla could have hurt her. Perhaps Layla's objective was to hurt me, but why? I scrunch my eyes, trying to remember if anything in our last correspondence might give me a clue as to why she's gone off the rails. I draw a blank, exasperated, and with a sigh, I head into my study. As I sit down, my phone buzzes with a text. Anna? It's Elliot. Hey, hot shot. Want to shoot some pool? Shooting pool with Elliot means him coming here and drinking all my beer. Frankly, I'm not in the mood. Working. Next week? Sure, before I hit the beach. I'll thrash you. Laters. I toss my phone onto the desk and pour over Layla's file, looking for anything that might give me a clue as to where she is. I find her parents' address and phone number, but nothing for her husband. Where is he? Why isn't she with him? I don't want to call her parents and alarm them. I call Welch and give him their number. He can find out if she's been in touch with him. When I switch on my iMac, there's an email from Anna. From Anastasia Steele, subject safe arrival, June 2nd, 2011, 2232 EST to Christian Gray. Dear sir, please let me know you have arrived safely. I'm starting to worry, thinking of you. Your Anna, X. Before I know it, my finger is on the little kiss she sent me. Anna, sappy gray, sappy, get a grip. From Christian Gray, subject sorry, June 2nd, 2011, 1936, to Anastasia Steele. Dear Miss Steele, I have arrived safely, and please accept my apologies for not letting you know. I don't want to cause you any worry. It's heartwarming to know that you care for me. I'm thinking of you too, and is ever looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. I press send and wish she, she was here with me. Her Brighton... She brightens up my home, my life, me. I shake my head at my fanciful thoughts and look through the rest of my emails. A ping tells me there's a new one from Anna. From Anastasia Steele, subject to situation, June 2nd, 2011, 2240 EST to Christian Gray. Dear Mr. Gray, I think it's very evident that I care for you deeply. How could you doubt that? I hope your situation is under control. Your Anna X. P.S. Are you going to tell me what I said in my sleep? She cares for me deeply. That's nice. All at once, that foreign feeling, absent all day, stirs and expands my chest. Beneath it is a will of pain I don't want to acknowledge or deal with. It tugs at a lost memory of a young woman brushing out her long, dark hair. Fuck. Don't go there, Gray. I respond to Anna's email, and as a distraction, decide to tease her. From Christian Gray, subject pleading the fifth, June 2nd, 2011, 1945, to Anastasia Steele. Dear Miss Steele, I like very much that you care for me. The situation here is not yet resolved. With regards to your PS, the answer is no. Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. From Anastasia Steele, subject pleading insanity, June 2nd, 2011, 2248, EST, to Christian Gray. I hope it was amusing, but you should, should know I cannot accept any responsibility for what comes out of my mouth when I am unconscious. In fact, you probably misheard me. A man of your advanced years is surely a little deaf. For the first time since I got back to Seattle, I laugh. What a welcome distraction she is. From Christian Gray, subject pleading guilty, June 2nd, 2011, 1952, to Anastasia Steele. Dear Miss Steele, sorry, could you speak up? I can't hear you. Christian Gray, CEO of Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. Her response is swift. From Anastasia Steele, subject pleading insanity again, June 2nd, 2011, 2254 EST to Christian Gray. You are driving me crazy. From Christian Gray, subject, I hope so, June 2nd, 2011, 1959 to Anastasia Steele. Dear Miss Steele, I intend to do exactly that on Friday evening. Looking forward to it. Wink. 
Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. I'll have to think of something extra special for my little freak. From Anastasia Steele, subject, grr, June 2nd, 2011, 2302 EST to Christian Gray. I am officially pissed at you. Good night, Miss A.R. Steele. Whoa, would I tolerate that from anyone else? From Christian Gray, subject, Wildcat. June 2nd, 2011, 2005 to Anastasia Steele. Are you growling at me, Miss Steele? I possess a cat of my own for growlers. Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. She doesn't respond. Five minutes goes by and nothing. Six. Seven. Damn, she means it. How can I tell her that while she slept, she said she wouldn't leave me? She'll think I'm crazy. From Christian Gray, subject... What you said in your sleep. June 2nd, 2011, 2020 to Anastasia Steele. Anastasia, I'd rather you, I'd rather hear you say the words that you uttered in your sleep while you're conscious. That's why I won't tell you. Go to sleep. You'll need to be rested with what I have in mind for you tomorrow. Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. She doesn't respond. I hope for once she's doing what she's told and she's asleep. Briefly, I think of what we could do tomorrow, but it's too arousing. So I push the thought aside and concentrate on my emails, but I have to confess, I feel a little lighter after some email banner with Miss Steele. She's good for my dark, dark soul. <sighs> yes, she is good for his dark, dark soul. She evokes changes in him that he never would have felt otherwise. Well, at least, you know, as far as we know. I mean, who knows what the future holds? Or the past, as the case may be, seeing how these events happened like 11 years ago. Wow. That would put her in her mid-30s, I believe. Yeah, mid-30s. And he's a few years older than that, so... Hmm. Huh. Guess me and Christian are about the same age. I think he's still younger than me, damn it. Well, anyway. All right, yeah, so uh, that's pretty much going to do it for that. Oh, one thing I wanted to note earlier. Um, as a dyed-in-the-wool American, I still find it really hilarious how E.L., um, she tries so hard to write an American voice, but every now and then, little... Um, little British things slip in. Um, in America, I, I've never heard anybody go into IHOP and ask for two portions of pancakes. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that's got to be British. If you're British, let me know if that's British. Um, I know I have uh, I know I have a couple of uh, viewers out there from the other side of the pond. So, um, But yeah, now we ask for orders. Yeah, two orders of pancakes. Or we'll both have pancakes. I mean, he is a little self-imposed snobbish I guess I mean it's funny I mean that's one thing I've always loved about it he comes from a very, he's rich and his adopted parents are rich I mean his whole family's rich but they never act rich I mean like his mother still cooks and she it's not like she cooks foie gras or you know serves caviar I mean she cooks fried chicken and macaroni and cheese I grew up eating fried chicken and macaroni and cheese. And trust me, I'm nowhere near rich. That's why I do the YouTube thing, to try to get rich. Um, how am I doing? All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, so stay tuned. Another one coming out soon, as soon as I can get another one out. So for the Couch Potato Mike YouTube channel, this is Couch Potato Mike reminding you guys that in the end, we're all stories. So let's make them good ones. See you next time, guys.